Hi, my name is Doug Duncan, and this is my wife, Wendy, and we're here to present on ministering to the spiritually wounded. But if it's okay, I'd like to open very quickly with a word of prayer. Father, we come before you and ask that your will would be done in this presentation, that we would glorify your name, that people uh, who need to hear this message would be able to hear it. And Father, uh, we just thank you in the name of your precious son, Jesus. Amen. His, name, his name we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay. And we are at the ENR 2022 conference <coughs> in Tallahassee, Florida. Mm -hmm. Bless you. So right. uh, we're going to begin our presentation with a little bit of introduction about ourselves. Um, I'm Wendy Duncan. I'm a graduate of Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary and uh, a licensed social worker. And um, worked primarily in the mental health field, public mental health field, most of my career. Now retired and I'm working as a life coach, a recovery coach for people that are trying to, uh, to work their way back to God, to reconnect with God. And, uh, I, well, let me just say this. Yeah. So I tell you that because I was a graduate of a conservative theological seminary. I was a social worker. I had a lot of background in mental health, but yet I joined a cult. And you know why I joined a cult? He recruited me. Yeah, I was a good recruiter. <laughs> <laughs> So you can introduce yourself. Okay, my name is Doug Duncan. I'm a licensed professional counselor. Uh, at, after leaving my cultic group, which I was involved in for the first 20 years of my adult life, I went back to school and got a master's in counseling so that I could help uh, former members of groups like mine. And so I've been doing that kind of work along with other mental health work for the last, oh, I don't know, 22 years since we've gotten out. Mm -hmm. But after we left, we were trying to figure out what happened you know, so that's how we got into this group that was, it was spiritually abused. Um, when I left, uh, I wrote a book. Okay. I can't hear God anymore, Life in a Dallas Cult, because I couldn't hear God anymore. And that was the last word that I said to our cult leader. Your voice is so loud, I can't hear God's anymore. And, you know, after we left, it took, it was a long process to get back Um with my relationship with God because I didn't know who he was anymore and I didn't he was not um how our cult leader portrayed him he was not the true God so it was a long process anyway yeah, so that's how we got technically interested. those weren't the last words you said well, yeah uh, <laughs> those were the most dramatic words you said to him yeah I say goodbye so <laughs> um but anyway that's how we got interested in cults and and um helping people that had been spiritually wounded how many of y'all have ever, ever heard the term spiritual abuse? Of course. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Because um, it's fairly new in our, in our, uh, a lot of people don't understand what spiritual abuse is. But spiritual abuse happens when a leader with spiritual authority uses that authority to coerce, control, or exploit a follower, thus causing spiritual wounds. It's a kind of abuse which damages the central core of who we are. It leaves us spiritually discouraged and emotionally cut off from the love of God. Uh, now, the term uh, spiritual abuse has slowly made its way into contemporary Christian discourse over the last 30 years. And it's been defined as the kind of abuse that uh, damages like I said earlier, the central core of who we are. And it differs from other kinds of abuse because it has that religious component. So uh, and it could be, you know, the uh, misuse or misinterpretation of scripture. It could be a uh, distortion of the character of God. You know, various things could constitute spiritual abuse. But the hallmark of spiritual abuse is that control and power. And what makes it so damaging is that pastors and leaders are abusing the followers in the name of religion. Um, our cult leader uh, it did not want us to get married. So we dated for seven years and we could never get his blessing. And finally, we just decided, well, we're going to get married anyway. 
and that's the beginning of the end. But there, that's part of that control. People would say, well, why did y'all, why did y'all just, why did he have to give his blessing? He was our leader. He was our spiritual authority. You know, he, we had to have his blessing before we could do anything. Mm -hmm. um, the book, The Subtle Power of Spiritual Abuse, I love the dedication because it says to the weary and heavy laden, deeply loved by God, but because of spiritual abuse, find that the good news has still happened from the bad news. Churches that abuse are very, as I mentioned earlier, Earlier, they're authoritarian, they're controlling, very legalistic. There's a whole list of things that you have to do uh, or not do. Uh, there's a requirement that you submit to authority that you obey. Uh, you don't ask questions. When I first started going to the Trinity Foundation, um, you know, we'd have a, a great big old uh, Bible study with all the Bible study groups meeting together. Our cult leader would do a semi-bible study and so i'd raise my my hand because i was a graduate of southwest seminary i would raise my hand and i would say well doesn't the bible doesn't this mean doesn't the bible say blah 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 blah, blah? he would you know just you know lash into me humiliate me and it's like this is the kind of this is what the seminaries are bringing for people like her <laughs> and so you know after you're ridiculed and humiliated they often then you stop asking questions it wasn't okay to ask questions. Um, they're very image conscious. They use a lot of guilt and manipulation and fear mm -hmm. and labeling of members. Um, a lot of people were labeled as a Jezebel. Um, of course. Mm -hmm. And so uh, the church has a lot of different ministries. They have the homeless ministries. Um, they have ministries to the refugees, to senior adults, to food pantries and clothes closets and prisoners. But where is the ministry in our churches that deals with people who are straying from God and who have been spiritually abused? What ministry in the church reaches out to those who have been wounded by the church, by religiously abusive groups, people that are estranged from God, people who have suffered spiritual abuse. How do we care for those people whose faith has been shattered and whose relationship with God and the church has been damaged? How do we reach out to the lost and wounded sheep who despair of ever reuniting with God? Shouldn't the church be the one that brings them back into the fold? Should we be concerned for those individuals who are out there, or sheep without a shepherd? These are individuals who have been wounded by abusive leaders in controlling churches, patriarchy churches, pseudo-Christian groups, uh, false religious groups. Many of them are believers. Many of them are believers, but now they don't want anything to do with God. They don't want right. anything to do with the church. My husband and I think we need to rethink evangelism. We need to think how are we going to reach out to this special population? We know, and the problem is not that we don't know how to do evangelism. We know how to do evangelism, especially in the Baptist church. But the problem is that most of the people in our church have no idea what spiritual abuse is. It just, you know, they, they can't fathom what that is. So there's not a lot of awareness of those those people who are broken Christians that are out there. And we need a passion, a passion for those wounded sheep. We need a burden to reach them and to bring them in. We also need a strategy because those folks are not easy. They're not easy people to work with. Because of their emotional and spiritual damage. No, I think this is good. Oh, so because of that emotional and spiritual damage, you're talking about people that have a negative image of God, a perverted image of God. Mm -hmm. Our cult leader taught that God hates you. Mm -hmm. He only loves you if you're a part of the body of Christ. But if you're not a part of the group, then you know God don't want anything to do with you. You're only loved if you're a part of the group. Uh, God was very wrathful. He had no mercy. He was mm -hmm. always waiting to squish you like a bug. Uh, so, you know, when I left Trinity Foundation, 
I wanted to reconnect with God, but I had to tell God, you know, I don't really like you. I want to, I want to have a relationship with you, but I don't really like you because I had been thought reformed into believing this false portrait of God. That he was angry, he was wrathful, he didn't have any mercy. Um, also, people that have spiritual damage, they don't trust. You know? They don't trust. And they're the ones that sit at the back of the, if they come to your church, they're going to sit in the back. And if they get triggered, then they don't run. Mm -hmm. uh, so they're very scared. It's very, very hard to reach them. Um, and they, you know, have weakened ego and spiritual identity. They don't have a spiritual identity. So I want to ask y'all to join me in your various churches in being a place where people can come in with pain and struggling and find welcome and support. We need to teach our congregation how to minister to those wounded sheep. Yeah. So, um, and just uh, on the tail of that last slide, I wanted to say that, that I really appreciated what uh, Barbara was saying in her presentation earlier about, God, and see, I'm, I'm stealing from yours. Uh, you know, how important it is to be good listeners and, and mm -hmm. to be compassionate when people come in. Um, because, you know, that and that dovetails with what we want to say, that there are some basic steps in ministry to these types of folks when they do come into your, your churches. And, and for and these really, these are in an order for a reason. And, and a lot of things you say, okay, you don't have to do them in this order. But these things you kind of do. First and foremost, you have to be a safe partner. You've got to be a safe place. They, the, the, the folks have been out on the seas, they've been caught in a storm, they need safe harbor. And they will say things and they'll ask questions that will seem way off base. And you just have to let them, yeah, you, let them do that. It needs to be a safe place for them to ask their strange questions. And not say working. things like, oh, well, that, I just, they're working through some weird stuff. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And not say things like, oh, I would never join a church like that, or I'd never be a part of a group like that. Yeah, we, we, we might get into it later, but okay. we, we, we went, <laughs> went to a church one time where a minister told us, and, and, and he was a wonderful, wonderful man, a wonderful minister. We, we, you know, we, we did love him, but, uh, you know, but he said, well, it just goes to show how important it is to know the Bible. Well, we knew the Bible. We knew the Bible before we got we got hooked into our abusive group. Um, it's just that our, our cult leader was very, very, very good with the Bible. I mean, he was, sure, he, sure. He was really good. But um, so, you know, I, I mean, that's just one of those things. Um, but OK, so you provide safe harbor, you develop relationships. Uh, James Walker had a good one. I say I'm, I can steal from everybody so, you know, <laughs> yeah, because we're going late. Uh, you know, was talking about how how uh, how important developing those relationships is in evangelism. It's the same thing with, with ministering to the, to the hurt, wounded sheep. And then once you've done those things, given them safe harbor and, and started to develop a relationship with them, then you help them work through their doctrinal issues because they certainly, they certainly have those. Um, furthermore, because of their unique issues, there will be many barriers that you will face in dealing, in dealing with these folks. Uh, obviously, they're going to be very fearful of spiritual authority, of ministers, uh, churches in general. Um, they are going to have uh, a distorted image of God, as Wendy was saying. It's based on, on what their cult has, has taught them. They say their cult, their abusive church. That's probably the language I should use. Um, and and because they have 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 been abused in that environment they're going to have difficulty seeing a church as a safe haven sure. uh, and so that that causes them to struggle with the idea uh or struggle even to see god's love and mercy and certainly uh, i think Wendy and i can both attest to how hard that was uh, they we need to recognize that they have a fear of being manipulated again uh, it's hard for them to trust others. They don't. They don't trust their own judgment. You know, once, once burned, twice shy, right? Um, they don't. They don't believe that they have good discernment. And they don't have good discernment. Uh, I think that, that. I think that could be said. But that. That's what makes them so gun shy. Um, it's important to understand that in time, the, their abilities in, in these areas can grow. 
But because they don't trust their own judgment and because they were in a place where they were told what to do and what not to do, they may have trouble making their own decisions. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I didn't think that personally I had a huge struggle with that because I was in leadership in, in my cultic group. And so, um, you know, so I would jump in and maybe, maybe mm-hmm. that part of, part of that's my personality too, but, uh, but, but I've seen that in a lot of other per- people that we've dealt with in our support group. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's important to understand that uh, anger is going to be a part of the healing process. Mm-hmm. They're, they're going to be angry when they get there. Yeah. Just, just, oh, a, just a side note on this thing that mm-hmm. might be helpful to, to sure. those who are listening is, in, in my experience, uh, those who have less trouble leaving a group, like in your mm-hmm. case, were more like the group dynamic already, and so it was just a gentle switch. In other cases, they had to change who they were mm-hmm. to fit into the group so much that they sort of lose sight of who they are. Mm-hmm. So now there's a process of even trying to figure that out. You have the whole identity issue, and I, and also, I, I know this. I wouldn't have said this shortly after coming out of our group, but after having dealt with so many abusive groups and cults and, you know, people from our support groups who have been in groups like Scientology and Jehovah's Witnesses and, and, and some very, I, th- I think our group was actually somewhat less destructive than some of the other groups that we've dealt with. And so maybe we came out with marginally less damage than some of these other people I've seen. I felt pretty damaged after Riley. Yeah. Uh, uh, but let me but just, there was damage, certainly. Yeah. Let me just there say this. Um, on that recognizing that, recognize that they have a fear of being manipulated. It's mm-hmm. never been gone without this before. About how the Bethel music and the Hill song and all that music. Um, if I go to a church and that's the kind of music that they're singing, I am turned off. I want to leave because I feel like they're trying to manipulate my emotions. I don't want you messing with my emotions. I don't want you to mess with my feelings. So that, I had that done to me in a cult. So, you know, I don't want that. And that music oftentimes can, is a manipulative thing. I think. I feel. That's you don't think the church should have good music? They have good music, but not that manipulative stuff. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I know what you mean. Uh, so I guess the question is here, how, how can clergy and ministers help and the congregation, and the congregation in general? Um, you know, in spite of all the baggage that women people have and all the barriers that you will have in ministering to them, it's important to understand some of the ways you can help. Um, they need a safe place and safe people to sort out the unbiblical teachings. Your church can provide a sense of what is normal and healthy. I realize there's no perfect church, but but certainly uh, your church, if it's a healthy church, is going to be way more normal than what they're used to. Um, you know, give them the opportunity to tell their story, feel accepted and listen to, just like Marvel was saying, uh, and listen to without judgment. Um, remember not to discount their stories or their emotions, in spite of the fact that some of it may seem outlandish, and certainly some of it is going to be their subjective experience, but... But still, it is their experience. Mm-hmm. And some of them have had some really bizarre experiences. And, 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 yeah, and mm-hmm. some of those experiences actually happen. Um, and you can certainly give them information on, on other resources, support groups, therapists, websites, etc. cetera. Um, many people who have been spiritually abused will have difficulty talking to other church members. They'll have a difficulty attending small group meetings or making small talk. Uh, sometimes it's difficult for them to volunteer. I remember when we first started our church group, our, church, our support group, um, one of the guys that came to us had been in a terrible cult group. He had been raised there. His father was the leader. And he talked about, you know, wanting to get back into a normal church. And he went to a Methodist church. Okay, fine. And the uh, Methodist uh, minister says to him, well, we got to find a way to get you plugged in. And that so freaked him out that he left and never came back. So I guess that a lot of people aren't going to want to, you know, hear that they need to get plugged in because they they have been so exploited in their time and their labor and their efforts. So uh, they may they may want to just come and sit and be ministered to sure, for sure. a while. Yeah. Uh, 
And another point one will make is uh, to let you know that they that how they present may be a defense mechanism. They're they're obviously wary of letting people get too close. We, um, as Doug said, we have a support group um, that meets once a month, and it's uh, it's you know people that have been spiritually abused or been in cults. And we have one woman who she's you know she's stepping out a little bit, trying to find a church to connect with. And so she said she went to an Episcopal church, and she said they are very strange. She <laughs> said she said, but I just watched them, and you know when they stood up, I stood up when I sat down. Um, she said, you know, they also call the, the, the preacher, they call him the, the uh, rector. And she said, uh, so she was having to learn a whole new language, too. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then also I thought it was funny because um, because she said, you know, I would go to some of their small groups and I would ask questions and I would watch them, see how they responded. So, I mean, people that have been abused, they're, gonna, they're watching you, they're listening to you, and they're watching you. And you may not think they are. Well. Yeah. So, um, so obviously, the long-term task of the church is to make disciples, and we want to we want to return people to healthy spirituality. We want to be there and 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 let them uh, rethink and rebuild their belief system. This is a process. Rome was not built in a day, as they say. So, um, the the idea. Of, that, that we're, we're going to just get get their doctrine, you know, whipped back into shape in the first six months. It's not, you know, this is not really, it doesn't happen on your timeline. People are going to take a while to do this. And things that might come up, you know, years later. Uh, you know, I think recommending good books for them to read. Wendy and I like to read, so, you know, that's been helpful to us. You know, reading, reading more positive books about spirituality. Uh, yeah, I enjoy reading C.S. Lewis and things like that. And Wendy likes uh, Henry Nowen or um, Brennan Manning and, and, you know, others that, that you know, good devotional uh, books that have helped us walk back toward, toward understanding that God is a God of love. Um, so uh, reframing trigger words, scary words. Uh, let's see, Kathleen. Norris, who wrote a vocabulary of faith, and we went to see her speak mm -hmm. one time when she was at Dallas, and she, you know, that's that's good. She talks about having to reclaim the language for yourself again because uh, she left the church, and then when she went back, she those words that they were saying were were scary. They were scary to her, and so she realized she was going to have to rethink them and reframe them so that they were her words. And they were scared that they were hope words now. All right. So characteristics of a healthy church focuses on God rather than the leader or the church or the denomination. So a healthy church is going to focus you and point you toward God himself. Uh, encouraging a relationship with God that's based on grace and not on performance. It celebrates the uniqueness of individuals invites questions and differences of, of, of opinion, honors people's boundaries, extremely important, um, lets God work in people's life on his timeline, not on yours. Okay. Um, unhealthy churches distort the character of God and misuse scripture in order to justify their unbiblical teaching and practice. <coughs> Abusive groups often define good Christian, a good Christian in terms of service, giving, Bible studies, prayer time. Lord, it makes me tired just to read lists, devotions and witnessing rather than a relationship with God. Uh, and, you know, a lot of times, obviously, the manipulation is subtle, but it's there. You can never give enough in a mental health church. But it, and those things like having quiet times and having prayer times and going well, to church and all of those things, and all they need to flow from who you are. As, you know, they need to flow from your relationship with God, mm -hmm. not as something that the, the preacher or somebody says, okay, here's what you have to do you know, in order to be a good Christian. Right. And the first church, the yeah. first church that I went to after uh, I became a Christian as an adult uh, would tell us that the really good Christians came to church on Wednesday night. You know, not, it was Sunday morning, Sunday night, but the really good ones came on Wednesday night too. Yeah. So, I mean, there was 
<clears throat> Another uh, key characteristic is the unhealthy groups are legalistic rather than rather than grace based. So you see a lot of that. Uh, perverted image of God. Unhealthy groups portray God as a God of requirements and rules. He requires sacrifices and misery. He's primarily a God of heaven and hell. He's portrayed as a lawgiver and judge. He's angry, punishing, vengeful, and wrathful. So we've had enough of that. Kind of <laughs> <Got it. laughs> All right. So clergy can help reframe the image of God. Uh, you can gently challenge their image of God as punitive and wrathful. Uh, you can help them rediscover the God of love and grace uh, by showing them teachings and scripture that demonstrate an accurate portrayal of God. Explore with them healthy views of God as merciful and loving. But they're going to pull out all those scriptures in the Bible from the Old Testament. Yeah. Uh, you know, and it's like, this is why I don't want a God. That, this is why I don't believe in God, because he did this, this, and this. And they take them out of context, and, and they use that to justify their continued belief that God is loving and merciful. Yes? So you mentioned God being wrathful. Mm -hmm. um, so I came out of a cult that did not believe in the wrath of God. They said that God was only love, and he was never wrathful, and never angry. We also know that's not true. So I think it's important. Right. One, sure of the things, the one of the things I think it's important to do, you mentioned taking the um, presenting the Bible in context. I think it's really mm -hmm. important that we... Because one of the things that I began to realize when I came out of this cult is that I actually came to appreciate the wrath of God because I understand that, well, first of all, the wrath of God is not for believers. It's only meant for those who reject Christ. That's one thing. But secondly, and this is really, the wrath of God is wrath against injustice. It's wrath against abuse. It's wrath against things that, you know, I'm glad God is angry about those things. Sure. You know, so it's not it's not that God's having temper tantrums, of, you know, and, and um, abusing people. That's so. So, yes. God is wrathful in the sense that God is His wrath comes out against injustice, but God is not abusive. Right, but God is not wrathful about somebody's failure to perform. No, no, of course and, not. And and, yeah. and and I think that's where the you know where the cult thing gets in there because it's if you fail to perform well enough in your servitude toward the cult leadership, then they you know they're always holding this idea of a wrathful, punitive God over your head. Sure. Yeah. You, no. No. Your point is well taken, but um, but I'm talking about the way that God relates to His children in the church. Yes, right. sir. Just not not to completely hijack it, but mm -hmm. this might be helpful to kind of both of this part of the discussion <clears throat> is that many times those who have been in these groups identify God as the leader. Right. So. When I've had a deal, for example, with former Gothard followers mm -hmm. who are now atheist, agnostic, or whatever, I have to start out with just because God and Gothard both begin with G O and end to D does not mean they're the same thing. No. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. So then that sets a different standard by which we're going to measure who God is. It, exactly. Exactly. And that, that's very well well put. But the leader has stepped in the place of God. Correct. So, yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Exactly. So. Um, yeah, and and again, uh, this cannot be overemphasized. You know, I, I I feel like I'm in recovery, and I'm still in recovery every day. I'm learning more and and, and learning more about who God is, and, and learning more about His His mercy. So, um, you know, that's a journey. It's a process. It's it's something that we're all still learning about as believers. So, uh, move forward here. All right. Oh yeah, this is the this is all the fun stuff. What not to say? I, here, here's one story that uh, that happened to, to Wendy and me when we went to a, a church and and in the Sunday school class, I, I guess we said something about having been in a cult. And there was a woman there who wasn't a real regular attender there, but she was just like she couldn't believe it. She goes, "They were in a cult," and then, and then somebody new came in the room and she said, "Did you know they were in a cult?" And then somebody else came over. They were in a cult, and we, of course we thought it was funny, but uh, trying to keep that quiet. Yeah, no. <laughs> you know, really kind of sort of wanted to keep it on the down low. Is hey, they were in a cult. So maybe, maybe that's one thing not to say. Uh, telling people, uh, you know, don't don't be so angry. Forgive and forget. Um, you know, 
when someone we know goes through a divorce, loses a loved one, loses a job, we generally do know how to be supportive. We understand and empathize with what they're going through. However, when someone leaves a spiritually abusive group, clergy and church members rarely understand the intensity of the loss and the confusion that the person is experiencing. Um, you know, saying that thing, I understand, is more, you, you know, that's not that's not really necessarily right. Maybe you don't understand if you didn't go through what I went right, through. Right. Uh, you, yeah. you, you know, it would be better to say, tell me what that was like and then listen. Or what, you know, what, what was that like for you? Something like that. Um, so, again, you know, it's that, it's that listening, being like Job's friends and, and sitting there and... and, and For the first week. But yeah, <laughs> being, being willing to, you know, to sit with somebody as they, as they go through their pain. But they also, sometimes the clergy, and sometimes preachers and clergy and ministers and all those people, they get very defensive. Mm-hmm. And so they say, but you know, there's no perfect church. Mm-hmm. And you want to say, well, I'm not looking for a perfect church. I'm just looking for one that won't hurt me. Yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. Um, the other one, I, and I think this, this happens a lot, is that people, you know, in their confusion are angry. Well, that's okay. Let them have their anger. Yeah. Uh, let them have their anger. They, I mean, it's, it's an emotional process. If you don't, if, you know, if you don't damn it up, it, it'll, it'll, Resolve itself over time. People will get it's over. One it. of the of grief. But but you don't you don't have to tell them get over it. Right, it's, right, right. It's like telling your wife, calm down. It doesn't work. It does <laughs> not. It does not. <laughs> those are not those, those yeah. are not ones that, yeah. that, that, that do well. Okay. Just move on. Yeah, yeah. Get over it. Yeah, yeah. Um. Yeah. Oh yeah, and here's the other thing. Telling people that by talking about what happened, they are gossiping. And see, yeah, yeah, that's bad. Or that you're not forgiving. Yeah, that you're oh, not yeah, forgiving. I get that too. Yeah. yeah. Oh, oh, you know, forget. I actually in the um, book that we brought, Wounded Faith, um, the one of the two chapters that I contributed is about forgiveness, and I do have. Um, a, I, I don't want to be too much of a spoiler here, but I, I do, in the chapter, forgive my cult leader, and I actually went back and met with him. I say cult leader. Uh, but I, I, a, whole, a whole bunch of stuff happened, and it wasn't until 20 years later right. you know, that, that it happened, and it was a lot of processing. I always tell the, in the, my support group, I always tell about C.S. Lewis, who said, you know, in, in his dotage, he said, I think I have finally succeeded in forgiving the headmaster you know, the school that I went to. So, um, you know, it, it, forgiveness, yeah, 100%. We, we're, we're believers, we're Christians, we believe in, in forgiveness. We we preach forgiveness, we love forgiveness, forgiveness for everyone, forgiveness all around, and forgiveness for the whole bar. But, uh, but forgiveness is not easy. No. And it can be, people I, people, I think, talk about Forgiveness in a way that is that is too facile mm-hmm. because it's a mm-hmm. tough it's a tough thing. And, and it, you know it should we should forgive. Mm-hmm. Our Lord forgives us. <clears throat> we should forgive. But but I, I don't want to preach cheap grace here. Can I tell my, my forgiveness story? Sure. Okay, so one time I forgive you if you do. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, one time I was in church and as I like to tell it, I was minding my own business and. Something came across me and said, you need to write Judy a, a letter of forgiveness. And I'm like, you know, where did this thought come from? Judy was my Bible study teacher. Um, and she did a lot of things. One of the things uh, she said to me when, when before Doug and I were going to get married is, God is going to kick your butt. And she says, you know, if y'all get married, God is going to punish. That I can't tell mm. you how. That's heavy. turned out to be true. <laughs> no. <laughs> why, why would you say God? Wait, wait. Why would you say God would punish you for getting married? No, that's that's that control. Well, that. Because the cult wasn't sanctioning they told them that us they getting be married. married. Yeah. Get married. So, but that whole week before we got married, I was so scared that something was going to happen to God. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. I was so scared, and um. So, yeah, I kind of held that with them. Anyway, so this something comes across and says, you need to write Judy 
a letter of forgiveness. I'm like, what the heck? So I uh, go home. As we're going home, I tell Doug this. And he says, huh, I don't know. And so I call my, one of my sisters and I tell her, and she said it was Satan. <laughs> That's always my first thought. <laughs> I said, the devil. I said, I, I, I said John, I don't think Satan would say that. You need to write a letter for people. It doesn't seem like something Satan would say. And people was like, well, you don't need to forget. You know, she was the one that was wrong, blah, blah, blah. She, and so uh, it kept coming up, though. I mean, I could not shake that. You need to write a, a Judy a letter of forgiveness. You've got to. And uh, so I told Doug, I said, I need to, I guess I need to write Judy a letter of forgiveness. So that day, I wrote a letter of forgiveness. And when Doug came home, I read it to him. And it was one of those letters that where you say, you did this, 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 and this, but I forgive you. You know, it was one of those kind of like, you're a horrible, miserable, horrible person, but I forgive you. And Doug read, reads it, and he says, I don't think this what God had in mind. <laughs> so I said, okay. A couple of days pass, and I write another letter. I give it to Doug when he comes home. And it's one of those letters where I used a lot of God's scripture, a lot of God. God said, blah, 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 blah. God a lot, said. lot of platitudes. Yeah. And Doug reads it, and he says, I don't think that's what God wanted you to do either. <clears throat> so I didn't know what, I didn't know how to let, write a letter of forgiveness. So we go to this conference, and we're sitting with, at dinner, we're sitting with some people who were Christians, and I tell them this story about how I felt like God was telling me to write a letter of forgiveness, and, but I didn't know what, how that, I didn't know how to do it. I didn't know what to do, and I said, you know, it's interesting, though. Her mother just died in a freak accident. She was drowned. Um, she was in a boat with Judy, and she fell over and drowned, and they said, well, maybe that's what you need to do. Write a, a letter of sympathy, condolence. And so I did. When I got back home, got a condolence card, I wrote a little short note, put it in the mail, and that whole thing lifted. Yeah. It mm -hmm. lifted. The burden of and the, that whole thing lifted. So I, I say all that to say sometimes we think forgiveness, you know, it, it, there's a certain formula. Right. Uh, but sometimes it's, you know, it's a different way. It's writing a letter. It's writing a letter of sympathy. So, you know. Mm -hmm. All right. I tell that story. So, uh, oh, did I? I was going to say I have a whole chapter on forgiveness in my book where I talked about the struggle that I went through with forgiving this one person, mm -hmm. and uh, and it seemed to like come up every time I went to some kind of seminar or women's mm -hmm. meeting that talked about forgiveness, and her name would pop up in my mind, and I started to get angry about it because I thought. Does the, I forgiven her? Does the Lord for, believe that I've forgiven her? And then, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, one of my colleagues said, well, maybe. And this is after I've gone through several different of these forgiveness type things. And uh, my colleague said, well, maybe if you could just write her a letter. Because woman was like on her deathbed anyway. And so I thought, okay, well, let me do that. So I actually... And she said, you may not even be able to confront her about her sin, but you can say that you do forgive her. I don't remember what I said because this was so long ago, but I actually did send her a card, write her a, a rather long letter, and uh, put it in her mailbox and uh, didn't hear anything back from her anymore uh, when that happened. But I just felt a lifting, like you said, where I really felt free. And now I can talk about the experience without the pain that was attached to it mm -hmm. at the time those mm -hmm. things happened. Yeah. Yeah. So, and but it is a process. It's a process. Yes, and it I, is. I think God does work in us, and He did in me. And forgiveness is not a lobotomy. It's no. not like, but the pain that was attached to the action is removed. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. right. I, I like that. Forgiveness is not a lobotomy. <laughs> I'm that borrowing one. that one. Uh, I stole that from somebody else too. <laughs> um, so we, we're talking about in the spiritual safe haven network, uh, which some churches are uh, banding together to to try to to do this. Uh, some studies were conducted regarding the prevalence 
and spiritual abuse and what avenues people chose to seek help. Uh, the study found that the majority of people sought help from mainstream religious organizations, but did not feel that it was beneficial. So, mm -hmm. you know, this is happening over and over again is that people have these experiences where you go to help, for help. Well, you go where you know to go, which is to the church, but so often the church doesn't know how to help. Uh, so uh, the Spiritual Safe Haven Network is a network of organization and individuals that want to offer a safe haven to folks who experience spiritual abuse. Uh, and we want to encourage clergy and churches to become part of this network. So Wendy and I are kind of kind of doing this. We, we, we've uh, uh, founded this Wounded Sheep Project, which is uh, it kind of all got put on hold with the pandemic, but we're, we're kicking it back up again. Um, it's a call to churches to reach out and minister to individuals who are estranged from God and church. We've, we've been called to heal the wounds, to unite what has been falling apart, and to bring home those who have lost their way. So what I want to say about this is a lot of these people are are already believers. I mean, it's like, sure. uh, and and they're, they're just wounded and, and in some ways confused. And, and they, you know, they've had something interrupt the process of discipleship and, and, and damage them in some ways. But they still have a wealth of, of gifts to share with the, with the church. And and we don't we don't want to uh not not let these folks be a part of, of, of the community um, you know it, we have to develop a strategy we have to develop a heart for them and, um, but you know there's a lot of wounded sheep out there yeah there's a lot every time we we go or how are we doing on time or oh, you're doing fine, fine. yeah um, I was just going to interrupt on a, sure. intrude on you for a couple yeah, of minutes. Yeah, no, please. Uh, well, one is I, I generally recommend to pastors to read a book by Janice Hutchinson, mm -hmm. uh, Out of the Cults and Into the Church. Mm -hmm. Right. Because churches don't understand. That's one. Two, um, I do equate what you're talking about to sort of a spiritual rape. Mm -hmm. And so if, if a woman has been raped and then she goes to church and their first reaction is to get over it, that's not helpful. No. No. She needs time to go, why should I trust anybody in this room? Right. Right? And I think just human nature is we're uncomfortable with people who are hurting. Mm -hmm. Because there, I think there's a fear that it'll get on us somehow. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And, and I I think, too, it's, it's even, there's another degree of complexity in the church. Because I think sometimes... <clears throat> clergy will think, well, is this person just a, a, a troublemaker? Because sometimes clergy is, you know, their, their natural inclination may be to sympathize with the other clergy, which is which is how, like, we're talking uh, with with Bob Stewart earlier about all the things going on at the Baptist Church, right. and, you know, and, and, and organizations, how they, they tend to, to want to protect themselves, but often at the expense of, of the herding sheep. So, um, yeah, so anything else, um, you know, I, I mean, I think that's really about our, our talk here, but we, we've got a little time, I think, if anybody wants to ask any questions or has it, yeah, yes, sir, and then we'll go to, okay, Andre, go Sure, ahead. well, I'll just last, last time I'll open my mouth here. No, you're um, good. <laughs> so, I, I want to, uh, I want to address something that, because I know you guys have been talking about cults and cult leaders uh -huh. and things like that, but one thing I want to address is that. Interestingly enough, the cult I was in was not, it was a false religion, yes. a new age religion, but it was not abusive or authoritarian. It was actually, they prided themselves on, oh, you know, they, 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 they were into this book that they thought was written by angels and stuff, okay? But, yeah. they, but they basically prided themselves on, you know, we're not manipulators, we're, you know, you got, you can have your own interpretation of the book, you can do, and um, one of the things, though, that kept me away from the church was I, for a long time, I felt like, I wasn't getting my my questions answered in church. And now, part of that is I have to be fair because part of that is that people didn't understand where I was coming from. They, right. didn't, they didn't understand the book. They didn't, but my point is that I felt like I was getting more love in the cult. You know, I was getting more um, acceptance and affirmation right. in the cult. And now I realize now that that wasn't really true. Um, that I mean, it's sort of it's true and it's not true. I do I do think sometimes cults are more um, at least they, they 
claim they act like they care more about their members sometimes than the churches do. That's why you know you have Jones. That's well, why it's hard for people to leave certain cults. You know, you know, yeah. the Mormons they they take care of their people. They do. Places, you know, but I guess the one thing the one thing I'll just yeah. say real quick and is that I think the thing I struggled with the most was um, with churches is not that the leaders were abusive so much. I, I got abuse from average church members, like, uh, like, like, especially in the name of accountability. Like, like you mentioned forgiveness. You know, telling people that they need to forgive is not going to help them forgive. Right. It's like saying, you know, get over it. So, like, uh, what I found was like people, people would people would throw scriptures at me. Like, if I told them I had a a, a really difficult time with my relationship with my mother because my mother's verbally abusive, they'd say, "Well, you need to honor your mother." You know, yeah. it was it, they would just throw the scripture at me instead of you know trying to really understand what was going on. Um, I think people sometimes use a, accountability as a, as like a, like, like a righteous police officer, you, you know, yeah. you, you're accountable to me, you know? So I, I, ha that was what I struggled with more than so much abusive leadership. It was more just people, just average people thinking that they could just, you know, they, they just throw scriptures at me or, you know. Right. So yeah, there's two or three things to kind of unpack with that one. But so a part of it, I think, some of this just grows out of our experience with what we experienced in our in our abusive cultic group, which was nominally Christian um, and authoritarian, and the leader was, I, you know, he had this James Earl Jones ish voice of God, you know, voice that. Um, yeah, and and so that was our experience. But we have we have encountered a lot of people with similar experiences. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously, just about anything can be cultic um, and 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 abusive in different ways. And you're exactly right. Uh, people can you know can can be abused in groups that are all about you know love and light and. Uh, you know the Dalai Lama and whatever else, but uh, but still, you know that's its own form of cultic abuse. It just shows up in a different way. Now Deb Pratt online, she's watching online. Yes, says uh, some cults uh, will pile on the love (parentheses love bombing and parentheses) as a recruitment technique. Yes, sure. that is true. <clears throat> and and our our group was actually pretty good at that. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, when I, I told y'all that so. Doug recruited me, I was at a very vulnerable time. I was looking for a church home. I was looking for a place that I felt accepted and I could belong. And I went to, uh, I met Doug, and he said, you should come over to the Trinity Foundation uh, on Sunday evenings. We have this potluck dinner. and It's like a big old family. We all sit around a big old table and eat and all that. And then we have a Bible study and we sing and we do this and that. Well, I went, and those people were so nice. It's the most beautiful music I've, I've ever heard. I mean, it was. It was love bombing, uh, exactly. And I, you know, I, I got hooked yeah, into you, it. You were vulnerable, and, mm -hmm. and you were pretty, and that's why I, you know, I that. <laughs> but, uh, that's why I was recruiting you. But um, and you're still pretty. But uh, old. <laughs> <laughs> you're like a pretty fine wine. Old. But yeah, so. Um, yeah, I, I, it is. It is. I, I, the other thing, and, and this touches on something that, that Andre was saying, I think there's an intensity in the relationships in cultic groups that is hard to find in, in, yeah. out in out in the uh, mm -hmm. world. Mm -hmm. I, you know, people or say out of the world, even in, in the mainstream churches, I, I don't think, and I'm just re resigned to it now because I'm old and whatever, but I I don't know that I'm going to feel as close to a group of people, even, you know, we're, we're, we're back in church. We have a church. We have, we have a good church. We have a, and we have nice people in our church, but, um, but I don't feel super, super close to them in the way that I did the people in my cultic group. But that's so sad. It is sad in a way, but, I don't know. Yeah, but but we yeah. you know, I, I called it a border a borderless society. Boundaryless. Oh yeah. What I say? Borderless. <laughs> yeah. A boundaryless. That's the United States now. <laughs> 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 because we lived in a semi-communal fashion, 
uh, you know, one my, most of the people lived on one block in Old East Dallas, and we were in and out of each other's homes. We had Bible studies just about every single day of the yeah, week. Yeah. Um, you know, you never lacked for people around you. So you hung out with these people all the time. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So you know, you but, were just never lonely because you had all these people, and you they would walk in and out of each other's homes without even knocking on the doors. And um, yeah, so we were, and you know, it, it was required that you say what's there. So in Bible study, before we even started, we would have to say, okay, so you might have anything to say? And people would, you know, talk about these very sensitive and very private matters in this group. So everybody knew everybody's business. Too too much so, honestly. Much, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, which is about boundaries. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And that was part of the damage in in leaving the group, honestly, was I had been so close to these people. I thought and, you were. Or, or thought I was, right. I, I mean, I'd been there at the hospital when their children were born. They had been at the hospital when my children were born. And, and you know, the, the, you just had years of, of togetherness close and close relationships. Yeah. And after all of that. we left, only one person uh, called us. Yeah, I mean, it was like, you know, sorry. Yeah. So, you know, sorry you have decided well, to. Well, we don't have time for you anymore. Yeah, yeah. It, we weren't, weird. we weren't formally shunned. I mean, they, they didn't quite, they didn't do that quite in the way like the Jehovah's Witnesses did, but it was like, you people have chosen to go back to, yeah. to the, the world. world. Yeah. <laughs> and I had bought a house on the block and Doug said, well, we're going to have to sell the house. And I said, why? I love that house. Why do we have to sell it? He says, it's, it, it, we just won't be able to stay here. And it, well, he was right because every time we go out our door, after we, you know, left, yeah. every time we went out our door, it was like we were ghosts. Yeah. You know, people didn't talk. Um, yeah, people didn't acknowledge you. It was bad. No, it was weird. It, I, it was I, weird. I still say. Is it the same now, 20 years later? You know, I, I, I there was a, a horrible thing that happened. One of the, uh, one of, one of the group of kids that had grown up with my with my kids as this young woman um it, that literally i i was at the hospital when she was born she was just like my daughters the same age as my daughters um and she died of cancer she had breast cancer and she died when she was 38 years old mm -hmm. and i i that that softened a few things and i i did see run into her mother and was able to say, I, I and it really, truly, mm -hmm. I, I was so sorry to hear about Becca passing, and, and of course I knew what was going on the whole time because my daughter was still, you know, so I, I had a, I had a spot, but, <laughs> um, but yeah, and, and I, you know, and then we saw, I, I saw Carrie and Judy ran into them because uh, we're still in Dallas, so we, you know, we, we have run into people from time to time. Uh, yeah, it, it, uh, yeah, I think that softened things a little bit. I, I don't, I don't know. I, I don't know if it kind of knocked them off their game a little bit too. And now Oli has died, the cult leader. So there's that too. So I don't know. We, we could probably go over there now and sit down and talk to them, but you know, mm -hmm. hey, it's still weird though. You know? mm -hmm. So. Well, I think that's about it. I, that's uh, anyway. We we. Uh, anybody else there have questions? Yeah. Oh, anybody no, online? Nothing new. Just SDAs do that as well. The love bombing. So. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. All right. Thank you, guys. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, Round of applause. <laughs> yeah.